to the Nemeth Report podcast. I'm Dr. Tammy Nemeth, energy historian, analyst, and consultant, and I'll be your host. Today, I'm pleased to welcome David Blackman. David enjoyed a 40-year career in the oil and gas industry, the last 23 years of which were spent in the public policy arena, managing regulatory and legislative issues for various companies in the United States. Currently, David is an energy-related public policy analyst and consultant based in Texas, where he maintains a growing media communications practice, and he is also a frequent guest on television, radio, and podcasts. He is a regular contributor to Forbes magazine and other publications. David is the author of the Substack Energy Transition Absurdities, where he documents the ongoing absurd nature of the Western energy transition. He also joins a weekly energy transition podcast with Brazilian engineer Armando Cavana and oilprice.com journalist Irina Slav. You'll find links in the description. There was an issue at the beginning of our recording, so it may seem that you're joining in the middle of the conversation because I had just asked David about his career transition and moved to Texas. We've been here since then, since uh, 2016, and I do some consulting, And uh, but I, what I mainly do is is write and talk about energy. And um, as you mentioned, I do have uh, actually a couple of podcasts that I, that I do of my own. One is uh, an interview show called The Energy Question, where I talk with folks like you who are experts in the energy field, CEOs of companies. Uh, man, I just talked to uh, a brilliant guy uh, named Tom Jensen, who's the CEO of Fryer Battery out of Norway that is... Uh, building an innovative uh, kind of new technology in the lithium ion battery space for backup purposes for solar and wind power. And, but I talked to oil and gas folks, uh, you know, uh, people like Daniel Jurgen, uh, who's, uh, you know, just a, also a brilliant guy like you who really understands energy and, um, and then the other podcast I do is with Armando Cavana. Uh, and Irina Slav, who is just a wonderful writer uh, based in Bulgaria, uh, who has tremendous perspective over the energy transition that is happening in Europe and, the, of course, the crisis that is happening in Europe. And um, really enjoy that. In fact, we, we just recorded uh, an episode of that, a few, finished uh, 20 minutes ago with our uh, weekly Monday morning recording of that podcast. So that's what I do. It's who I am. And, uh, you know, energy is, is what I do. It's what I've always done. And I'm happy to be able to continue doing it. So what did you talk about today on the energy transition podcast? I, I found out about that uh, about a month ago and started tuning in and I wish you would publicize that more because the conversations are so fascinating. Um, there's such a a mix of expertise and knowledge there that the three of you bring together just to sort of unpack a lot of the stuff that's going on um, currently that I think people should should hear. Well, thank you for that. Yes, we you know we're we're like uh, so many struggling to find uh, you know to build the audience. It gets bigger every week, thankfully. Uh, we don't have a budget for advertising, but we do put it out on in social media and and uh, and uh, obviously on YouTube. And uh, today we had uh, guests on uh, 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 Professor Robichaud from from a university uh, in um, in Brazil, who uh, Armando is a colleague with who's a really intelligent, smart guy, understands everything that's happening in the energy space, and Stuart Turley with the Sandstone Group, uh, whose company uh, serves as the host and producer for our podcast. Uh, another really smart guy who who has a podcast of his own and probably will be calling you soon <laughs> to appear <laughs> on his own podcast. Um, and so we had a really uh, a lively discussion around current events in, in the energy transition, and, and it was centered around technology, it, you know, and whether we really have the, the technology existing to make the energy transition as it is envisioned at the UN and at these COP27 conferences and, you know, by the EU and the Biden administration, do we have the technology 
to make that transition happen. And I, I think there was a, a general agreement that uh, we really don't, as I think everyone has found out the hard way this year. So it, well, it was a it was a fun discussion. Well, I'm going to have to go check that out. I missed that this, this today. Um, it's interesting that you say that about technology because I had a very interesting conversation with Francis Menton a few months ago, and we were talking about the uh, the idea of having demonstration projects and why there haven't been publicized really big demonstration projects because. If this idea, if they think this is going to be so amazing, then why not have, say, Greenpeace, the World Wildlife Fund, Extinction Rebellion people, why don't they just go buy a town, move in there, and do net zero? Show us how it's done. Sure. Show us that it works, you know? Only walking to work, only taking unreliable <laughs> public transport. Right. Maybe they can make it, they can make it work. Use only renewables have a, a, a toned down lifestyle. So show us, prove to us that it can work before you upend the entire global system to bring in something that, you know, there's been smaller projects that are completely unsuccessful. So show us that it can be done. Yeah, yeah and, and what we get instead is this, this narrative that is so pushed so heavily in the news media by our entertainment and academia industries. Um, and government officials all in coordination with each other, you know, telling us how wonderful it's all going to be and how clean everything's going to be. And it's all going, all we need to do is, uh, spend trillions and trillions of dollars on subsidies and tax incentives and it'll all pay for itself. And of course that isn't going to happen either. Uh, it, meanwhile, if, if today's a, a great example of, of, of how this all happens. So we have this announcement from the federal government today of a new breakthrough in nuclear fusion, right? Uh, uh, which, my gosh, how many times have we read the head, same headline over the past 25 years that they've actually seen an energy gain in nuclear fusion for the first time? And, uh, I, you know, and okay, so show us, uh, demonstrate that for us. But we'll see that story and it'll, it'll make, it'll be the headline news on every TV network today and it'll disappear and you'll never hear anything else about it because it most likely isn't true. And, uh, but, but people who, who watch CBS and ABC and NBC for their news are going to say, oh, well, gosh, the government's had a big breakthrough in nuclear energy. Everything's going to be great, but everything's not going to be great because, you know, that probably isn't really what really happened. And um, it's the same thing on battery technology, which, uh, you know, for, for backing up wind and solar power. I just uh, interviewed on my podcast last week, as I mentioned, uh, Tom Jensen with Fryer Battery, and they are making a, a, a new kind of lithium ion battery for, for backing up uh, wind and solar and power generation, which is, you know, desperately needed an improved, improved battery technology. And a couple of months ago, I interviewed the CEO of a company that's making vanadium batteries, an alternative to lithium ion. And so, but for the last 20 years, we've been told in our news media, and according to this narrative, that these innovations and these new technologies that are a miracle and going to solve the whole problem are always just around the corner. Well, now, at least what we're seeing now is they're actually there. They've been made, they're real. And now we're just now starting to sort of install them and try to scale them up. And, and so the, the, my point is not that, that these are false technologies, but that the reality of this energy transition is a whole lot more messy and time consuming and expensive than the narrative keeps trying to tell us it's going to be. And that's a very yeah. expensive problem for our societies. Yeah, for sure. Like the expenses is one aspect of it. And it's also the scalability. And um, when I speak to engineers, they're always like, oh, well, these are the things that work in university, you know, in a controlled environment <laughs> where, you know, it's a nice small thing and they can get it working and so on. But when it comes to scalability and, and, and rolling it out on a larger scale, suddenly all the problems and 
when we think of what are the material inputs for something to, to build these backup batteries on a scale to back up a city or a region, right. um, it's phenomenal. So this, I think I had a conversation with Armando about this. It's the, the inbuilt contradictions of the environmental movement, where on the one hand, they're saying, we need to pursue this renewable thing at, at breakneck speed. And they they condemn the oil and gas resources because of the the inputs and all of these different things and land disturbance and so on. But think of the land disturbance oh that's required for the mining alone for batteries and oh. all of the rare yeah. earth elements and the refining of of these things and so on. It's it's catastrophic to some extent, and yet we're supposed to <laughs> walk down that path. It it doesn't make yeah. sense. I, I interviewed some folks at uh, IHS Market in August who had conducted a copper study, a global copper supply study. The IHS Market is a, is a really smart uh, bunch of a group of engineers, actually uh, led by Dan Jurgen as, as vice chairman. And uh, and and you know, so they, their study finds that we're just in the next 20, 30 years, we're going to need 400 new massive copper mines. To meet demand, well, that isn't going to happen. That where are the copper mines going to be permitted in the Western world anymore? Yeah. Okay, that's not going to happen in the United States. It's not going to happen in Europe. It's unlikely to happen in South America outside of perhaps Chile, you know, which is is the world's largest supplier of copper. Um, and it's because of just what you talk about. It's a catastrophic devastation to the environment. Yeah. Um, and 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 these environmentalists don't seem to understand that that's what's going to be required to do what they're advocating that we do, is catastrophic, catastrophically, devastate huge portions of the natural environment. Um, the other thing, and and you're seeing it, I think you're you're in England, and uh, you're seeing it in in in, in Great Britain now. A return to burning wood for electricity, uh, clearing forests in Europe, all across Europe, to 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 generate electricity. This is a 16th century technology, and and but that's what environmentalists are calling green energy now. It's it's just mind boggling to me the whole thing. Well, I saw. Sorry, I'm, a... I'm getting angry about this now. <laughs> I don't mean to make you angry for sure. It's just, <laughs> it's terribly frustrating. And there's, it's not as if there isn't studies out there explaining the limitations to the technology and the contradictions. It's, it's baffling to try to understand and wrap your head around why are the Western leaders ignoring that? Why are they walking down this pathway that um, is, going to lead to so much poverty and impoverishment of their citizens. And right. I, I think one of the, being someone who likes to focus a bit on energy security, it it's distressing to think of how there's energy security, which is linked to food security, which is linked ultimately to national security. And I feel like that whole concept of national security, even with what's going on with Russia and China and the buildup in, around Taiwan and whatnot, it's just not part of the equation. They think that somehow renewables will bring energy security and whatnot, but it's just deferring one sense of um, dependencies to another. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and they seem to think that renewables will do that because Fatih Birol keeps saying that. At, yeah. at every, that's the answer to every question uh, related to energy uh, in the mind of Fatih Birol, who leads the International Energy Agency, is we need more renewables. And it doesn't matter what the problem is, that's the answer. Yeah. And uh, if that was the answer, then, then the entire European continent would be the most energy secure place on earth today. I mean, and so would California. And instead, they are the two possibly, well, they're certainly the two most insecure, energy insecure places in, in the first world uh, and, and in the, the Western democracies. Um, and, and, and there's a reason why that's the case. It's because 
they have bet their entire future on on modes of energy generation that are not ready to to fill the bill, and uh, that's largely due to uh, the failure to de to develop the technologies needed to make that happen in advance of subsidizing them. And so, you know, we've spent more than $20 trillion over the past 25 years subsidizing wind and solar and electric vehicles. And they've gone from occupying, generating, or filling 2% of the world's uh, energy needs to filling 3% of the world's energy needs. So it's, um, it's really kind of a losing proposition at this point. For sure. And, you know, I lived in Germany for six years. And even then, um, before all of this, it was more expensive to pay our utility bill than our mortgage. It, and that was before mm -hmm. all of this crisis stuff. Right. And just how unreliable their grid was. It was, we would oh, really bright and then, you know, explode or something. And it was, <laughs> I, I was thinking, how, how can you possibly run a modern society, an industrial technological society, on such uh, unreliable energy, it, it's yeah, yeah it, it's well, and 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 it's not you know, and I, I mentioned uh, Europe and, and California, but I mean we're, we're we're seeing the same thing happening in Texas. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know we we had the catastrophic grid failure uh, in February of 2021, and. You know, all forms of power generation on our grid failed to some extent during that horrible winter storm that hit us. And, but it, you know, what was the first to drop off? The first immediate knee jerk to try to blame it all on natural gas. But in the depths of that, of that winter storm, natural gas was providing almost 80% of the power being generated on the grid, which normally it provides about 40 to 50% in Texas. The first two modes of, of generation that dropped off the grid when that storm blew in were wind and solar. And, and that's very predictable. We all know that's going to happen. And in fact, we all know that's going to happen so much that the representative for the wind industry who testified to a legislative committee just a couple of months after it all happened said that wind and solar renewable energy performed as expected during the winter storm. And that's absolutely true. They yeah. failed catastrophically. And that's always going to be the case because they're, until you can really back them up with storage, and even after you can do that, the, the, the generation capacity itself is always going to fail during critical severe weather events, because that's how it works. And uh, there's nothing you can do about that. Even if you build all the, the backup in the world, uh, the, the generating capacity itself is always going to fail. So you, you just can't build uh, an entire system that operates on renewable energy. And the sooner everyone in a position of authority recognizes that, and begins to deal with it realistically, the better off we'll all be. For sure. Um, one of the interesting studies I read was out of Harvard a few years ago, where they were talking about the potential implications of, because they want to put these wind farms up everywhere, mm -hmm. in changing wind currents. Right. And I was thinking <laughs> about what that would mean for the continental US, the continental Canada, and all these offshore wind turbines, and they keep trying to say that change in weather patterns and so on is because of human caused um, emissions and so on. But what if there's a contribution of all of these windmills being put into these places of currents, wind currents, and and that's creating some shifts? Where are the right. studies, you know, looking at that in more in more depth? Well, I mean, the government uh, has created this cottage industry where it will fund uh, any study that's going to blame something on global warming and, and fossil fuels. And, you know, any study that's going to, whose predetermined outcome is, is going to be consistent with the prevailing narrative, they're happy to fund. But there are no government subsidies and funding for studies that, that work contrary to the prevailing narrative. 
and so we don't see them. I, uh, what are we going to do without bird populations? Uh, my, migratory bird populations, the Texas Gulf Coast is, is home to the most diverse, the world's most diverse assortment of migratory bird populations. Uh, it is being devastated now by all these uh, new wind farms that are being built along the South Texas Gulf Coast. These birds are disappearing. Uh, suddenly, the green jays that used to be abundant across South Texas when I was growing up there uh, are now almost never seen because of, of the wind tower devastation that's happening. And, um, you know, nobody wants to talk about that. It's a huge issue. Uh, I, I don't understand environmentalists, people who claim to care about the environment and about endangered species. How could you possibly be in favor of, of building massive wind farms uh, in areas that are home to bald eagles and golden eagles and all these birds that have been recovered through the, the, the Endangered Species Act now suddenly having to try to wind their ways through these gigantic fast rotating blades that will kill them if they run into them. And, I just don't understand the, the mindset that is leading to all of this devastation. Well, it's not just the birds. There was um, a study done in Germany in one of the states there because the, the, um, the states wanted to know why the efficiency of the wind turbines reduced so dramatically very quickly and the efficiency of the turbines never really recover. So they sent some engineers out there to take a look so they climb up there, they take a look at the blades, and they realize, oh my gosh, they're filled with bug guts. Oh, sure, and, yeah. and the the engineer said, well, if I correlate this with the supposed insect apocalypse that they're blaming on farming, it actually <laughs> coincides with the installation of the wind turbines. And that the, the insects were using these wind currents to do whatever migratory things that the insects do. And, and the, in the conclusion of this study was that um, I think we might be partially responsible for the insect apocalypse hitting Europe. And the state just kind of pushed the study aside, said, thank you very much. We'll have to figure out some way to scrape the bug guts off. But, yeah. you know, they still continue to blame farms. So my concern is that um, in Canada, in some of the big agricultural areas, they want to put up these wind turbines everywhere. And if we grow a lot of canola uh, and other flaxseed or whatever, things that, that need pollination, and they wipe out a lot of the insects because of these wind turbines, then what's that going to do to the agriculture, you know? And with respect to Texas, I was wondering, is there a link between declining monarch butterflies and these wind turbines? Because they seem to be put along the migratory route uh, of the monarch butterflies as they as they fly north. Well, that would make sense. I haven't heard anyone make that connection, but yeah, we've we've had a, a real massive uh, decrease in in the population of the monarch butterflies that you know migrate between Mexico and Texas. Um, during the year, I, I don't know if, if the, the, the wind farms have anything to do with it, but it's, it's a terrible thing. It certainly is. But as you say, who's going to fund that research, right? And, right? and as a researcher, if they do find that out, are they going to communicate it? Because if you pin something on renewables, your career's over in, oh, in sure, academia. Yeah. So. Well, that's right. And, and even if you do communicate it, who in the news media is actually going to report it? I mean, so the true. news media is this monolith now that only reports some stories that are consistent with this prevailing narrative and do not report anything else. And so it, it's, it's, it's like the butterfly effect. <laughs> what, no, it's like the old uh, adage about if a tree falls in the forest uh, and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, you know, if the news media, no one in the news media is willing to report anything contrary to the narrative, well, only the narrative uh, becomes uh, just uh, what everyone understands. And it's this self self perpetuating kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. So what do you think 
um, is the future for the United States with the energy transition? Because the Biden administration seems to be somewhat schizophrenic um, on the one hand, pushing forward the the Infra, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is really the Green New Deal light and um, promoting all of this stuff. And then on the other hand, wasn't there a statement um, by someone who was complaining about the fracking industry not reinvesting in more development and right. and signing yeah. natural gas deals with the UK and Europe. So, what do you what yeah. do you think of all that? Yeah, that was Amos Hochstein, uh, the White House uh, uh, energy advisor, uh, who still lives with his parents and is proud to say so. That <laughs> <laughs> this is the quality of individual we have in our government. Um, yeah, over the weekend he chastised. Uh, both the industry and the financial industry for, for not reinvesting enough in in upstream projects to, to find and drill for more shale oil and gas, which was incredibly ironic coming from this administration. The key, the key to understanding Biden's administration is, is to contrast what they say in public to what's actually happening in their regulatory uh, agencies. and. Uh, What's happening in the regulatory agencies is a, an all out unending assault on the viability of the domestic oil and gas industry there. You know, uh, the, the oil and gas business, though, is, is, is highly flexible and adaptable and always has been. And, and as a result is able to continue to. You know, get its business done mainly in states like Texas uh, and, and Louisiana where the, the state government uh, is friendly and, you know, wants actual business development within its borders and doesn't have a lot of federal land. Uh, in states like New Mexico, where the state government is hostile and where federal lands are prevalent, uh, we're seeing a real uh, difficulty now for producers in that part of the Permian Basin that's in New Mexico in getting new permits to drill. And the ability to build, you know, gathering systems to to get the oil and gas to market. So, it's a real, it's just kind of a checkerboard thing here in the United States right now. And as long as uh, this administration's in office, that's going to continue. It will all depend on elections. Uh, what happens at, after twenty twenty four? Right. So another two years of uh, this. Craziness, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, I I know that in the United States it's similar to Canada, maybe not to the same extent of the sort of litigious nature of the environmental groups to stymie uh, infrastructure building for hydrocarbons. So whenever there's a pipeline coming through or a proposed pipeline, these things get tied up in court for years, and you need more yeah. and more studies and so on. And so even if the the industry is able to increase production. There's no guarantee they can actually deliver it to the people who need it. That's right, and and it's why it, it you know these statements from the White House that that we see periodically chastising producers for not drilling enough or refiners for not refining enough diesel are are, are just so hollow because we see them working hand in glove with, with the opponents of the industry to stop projects like that. Uh, the whole thing on refining, yeah. you know, we have an administration whose secretary of energy just says almost, I mean, it's like a monthly thing. She'll, she'll make a statement publicly that they want to put oil and gas out of business within the next 10 years. Well, to build a new refinery, it would probably take you 10 years just to get the permits, much less the, 10 to $15 billion in capital, you'd have to be able to raise to, to even kick off per, uh, construction of the thing. And, and it's just, it's this absurd, it's, it's really a, a, a bizarro world almost where energy policy is concerned. And it's, it's really becoming, um, I, you know, I, I, I do think we have to, at some point, stop giving these people an out by saying they are merely naive and stupid. Uh, I think I think we have to at some point recognize that this is and, and start talking about the fact this is really all just part of their plan uh, to to radically increase drive up costs of energy, 
to make uh, fossil fuel energy unaffordable so that you have no choice but to adopt these far more expensive and costly and uncompetitive kinds of, of energy generation technologies like, like wind and solar electric vehicles. Uh, the real solution to all this, if, if governments would just get behind it, is to build more nuclear. I mean, if you really want zero emission uh, power generation, ultimately we're gonna have to go to nuclear because these other technologies are never gonna be truly viable to get us there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and which is why it's interesting that it's not being promoted. So if it's truly about emissions, if it's truly about this, then nuclear is the way to go. And I was at a conference where um, they were talking about nuclear and it was, it was not too long after the Fukushima disaster. And the environmentalists stormed the conference and were so emotional and yeah. freaking out. And everyone was, was just sort of, oh my gosh, they're really serious. They're so passionate. And I'm thinking, okay, so they're passionate, but that's not a good basis for designing your national energy policy because there's all kinds of passionate people for many different things. So why are you choosing that type of passion, the uh, how dare you people, versus those who are passionate about keeping the lights on, keeping their houses warm, getting to work every day, um, having a good life. And I, I just- <laughs> Being able to feed people, right? Being I able mean, to feed people. Having food. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Which which is another thing that, that people completely don't understand is, is how critical it is to have, I mean, really natural gas as much as anything else to feed the world because that's what fertilizers are made from. And, you know, um, and there's no viable alternative to that, despite what the propagandists want to tell you. Right. So, for example, in the EU, they were pushing this idea that as part of the EU Green Deal and their biodiversity uh, pillar, is that by 2050, they want half of the farmland to be organic and that they were going to get rid of the industrial fertilizers and replace it with manure and oh, sure. yeah. you know, various other things. But at the same time, they're saying we need to reduce the herds of cattle, uh, pigs, sheep, whatever, by 80%. So where are they gonna get the manure from <laughs> if they're going to be, you know, saying there's no more animals. And then in, and I find this just so disgusting and abhorrent, but in the EU and parts of the UK, they permit the spreading of human waste on food crops. So it's like, how is this going to be helpful? And what about sickness outbreaks? There's a reason why we right. haven't been using human waste on food crops before. Yeah. So what makes them think now is a good time? That, uh, that doesn't sound like a particularly brilliant plan, does it? I mean, that's the plan that uh, completely collapsed Sri Lanka's economy and society last year and this year. Um, you know, we see the Netherlands in particular going heavily down that road right now, throwing farmers off their land and uh, shutting them down. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really right. so frightening. This is this is my concern about the negotiations going on right now in Montreal with the yeah. biodiversity conference, the UN conference, which is known as COP 15 for biodiversity. And it started in these um, areas designated for nature and they set them up right beside farms. And then mm. a few years later, now they're saying, Oh, I'm sorry, you farms are polluting with nitrogen, right. um, these nature areas. So now you have to shut down. So Canada and a bunch of other countries have said that by 2025, one quarter of their land will be set aside for nature and 50% will be set aside by 2050. And it's like, okay, so you're gonna set it aside for nature. What, what are you going to do? Where are you going to grow your crops? Where are people supposed to live right. if you designate all these places for nature? And if a farm happens to be beside it, is it going to be the same thing as the Netherlands? And now you're saying you can't farm. So how are you going to feed people? So it's, I'm, I'm concerned that they're there negotiating these kinds of things without people really understanding what all this means. Oh, yeah, And absolutely. I think, 
you know, and the public gets afraid. They don't want to be seen as as saying nature. We don't want to protect nature because who doesn't want to protect nature, right? Of course, yeah. But that's why that anybody who who discusses and and talks about and tries to publicize the truth about all these things immediately gets shut down as a climate denier or whatever you know the the label is of the week. And uh, but, but because they can't they can't. They can't allow the public to become properly informed in advance of taking these authoritarian actions to throw them off their land or, or whatever it's ultimately going to be. So they, they, they rely on an ignorant public in order to get all this stuff done. And, you know, Canada is, is really, really the most frightening example of this right now, other than, than, than Europe, because. You know, uh, the people in Canada and the Western part of Canada all understand and can see what's coming. And it's like you get to the West of Alberta in Canada and no one will actually even allow you to to speak the truth, much less try to understand it. And um, it, it, the, the government there, the Trudeau government has become frighteningly authoritarian in nature and uh, it's it's really a, a very problematic thing happening there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm from Canada and and we still have family there and um, talk to people in Alberta and Saskatchewan, which are the big uh, oil producing yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that Canada <laughs> Trudeau has said that there's no business case for natural gas. <laughs> and everyone. <Yeah. laughs> Kidding me? Find out what is it? A fifteen-year deal with Qatar um, to secure LNG, and the UK has just signed a deal with America to secure yeah. LNG for like fifteen, twenty years. But somehow Canada, there's no business case. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, you know, the thing is, I mean, I understand that the argument that well, we don't have any LNG export facilities currently in existence, but it honestly. Uh, as we've seen in the United States, if you can get an expedited permit process in place, it only takes a couple of years to to get an LNG export facility built and running. And um, it's not like building a refinery or something. And 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 so it, there may not be a business case tomorrow, but if you take the the proper view that investors take. There's certainly a, a valid business case uh, for LNG exports from Canada. My God, it's the country is just wealthy in it. Yeah, for sure. And the same thing with with oil. If we could get it exported, sure. but as you've seen with Keystone XL, and mm -hmm. there was at least three other pipelines that you know were withdrawn because the process takes forever, and there's so much political opposition to it that it makes it, you know, the companies put what it, what did I read? Uh, one company put in a billion dollars in the process and ended up having to pull it out in the end, yeah. you know, before it even got to the, the final approval stage, because they figured it wasn't going to get approved anyway, and they'd already right. spent so much money on it. So, well, I yeah. mean, TC Energy had already, you know, uh, Keystone XL was a $10 billion project and TC Energy had already spent, had already built about 40% of that pipeline had, had had put four billion dollars into yeah. the ground uh, when Biden signed that executive order, uh, which you know that's a signal to to the others who want to build pipelines to bring uh, Canadian crude into the United States to say, oh well, you know there's no law here, there's no predictability in the laws or regulations in the United States, so we can't take the business risk. Yeah. Which is really which, unfortunate. By the way, which, by the way, was the main reason Biden signed that executive order. What about oil and gas? It was about destroying the confidence of investors to invest in oil and gas in the United States, which is why the statement made by Amos Hochstein uh, on Sunday is so unbelievably hypocritical, just unbelievably so. So I've... I've heard a couple of things, um, and I, I want to get your opinion about this. So Jason Bordoff was speaking back in September, August, September, talking about how now is the time to start nationalizing 
oil and gas in America. And I know that in the United States, that's a difficult proposition at the best of times, let alone yeah. now, never. Um, but there's some merit to the argument, and, and I've seen this made in Canada by certain leftists, that what they really need to do is tank the share prices and make sure that the existing oil and gas companies can't get investment, can't get insurance so that the shares plummet. There's And so then groups can swoop in who are approved or the state and can snap them up for bargain basement prices for a form of nationalization. And what they were talking about wasn't just that the state would purchase it and you'd have a state oil company or a state natural gas company, but almost a fascist system or a corporatist system where these are the sort of approved groups that would be acceptable who are in alignment with whatever end game is being played here. Um, mm -hmm. And they would be the ones controlling those assets um, for Canada, Europe, the United States. Now, do you think that is even feasible in the United States? Well, I, under certain political conditions, it certainly could become so. I, I mean, the, the political left, uh, not just in the United States, but across the Western world is becoming uh, overtly fascist in nature already. And, um, you know, the Democratic Party in the United States is, is basically being run by that element of their, uh, of their constituency. And um, so, you know, if they are, should be able to, let's say in the next election, get veto proof majorities in both houses of Congress somehow and elect a president, uh, reelect Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden's obviously willing to do anything they tell him to do, then yeah, I, I could see a scenario where, uh, you know, you'd have a president who could just say, hey, I'm gonna declare a national emergency like Franklin Roosevelt did during World War II and invoke uh, my emergency powers to nationalize these oil companies for, you know, uh, under the, arguments of the climate alarmist movement and, uh, you know, so that we can direct the oil and gas industry how we see fit. And uh, it's not impossible. I mean, it's patently unconstitutional. And, you know, the courts, if the courts uh, were willing, would probably strike it all down eventually. But you'd end up in a situation where, I mean, we already have a, an administration that by and large ignores uh, court orders all the time. So even should the Supreme Court strike it all down, doesn't necessarily mean that the people in power, if they control all levels of power, are going to obey the courts even. And yeah, I mean, I, it's not that far-fetched. We're, we're probably halfway down that path right now as we speak. So um, and it's clearly what the people on the far radical left want at the end of the day. Right, which is why, you know, there's been this messaging layering. So you get Jason Bordoff saying something and then you see, hear somebody else say something and then you hear Biden and the other people complain about the oil companies not doing good by the people. You know, oh, the, the prices are so high and they're not doing enough and why are they just buying back shares? Why are they not investing? To create this public acceptance of the idea that those companies are not working in the best interests of the people, right. and therefore it needs government to <laughs> to step in yeah. and and solve the problem. So, yeah, I can see how that groundwork is being laid, but whether or not they actually act on it, um, I think you're right. They're about halfway there, but we'll see. We'll see what well, what happens over the winter here. You know, a few years ago, I would have told you, no, that could never happen in the United States. Uh, just a few years ago, um, but, but things have really changed dramatically in terms of what can and can't happen in the United States. And, and once you get to a point where a political party, which the Democratic Party I'm talking about, is willing to just simply say, that we know best and we're not going to obey court orders. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking about the Department of Interior refusing to hold 
lease sales it is required to hold under the law and has been ordered to hold by at least three different courts now. And the Supreme Court has upheld the rulings of the appellate courts. Uh, when you have a political party that's willing to take that posture, then anything is possible. Uh, and if they're able to regain all levers of power and, and end up with big majorities in Congress here anytime in the near future, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm finished, you know, saying, oh, they would never do that. I, I think we've seen too much already to ever believe that again. Well, I hate to end it on such a sad note, <laughs> but um, I think I've taken a lot of your time already this morning, and I'm just very grateful oh. that, that you were able to have a chance to chat with me about, about these really important issues. Oh, they're very important, and I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been great talking with you, and I look forward to uh, returning the favor in January. Looks sounds good. Sounds good. Well, I hope you have a good Christmas and that there isn't another big Texas storm yeah, <laughs> that shuts too. down your energy. <laughs> me too. We're actually supposed to get some uh, pretty radically cold weather here over the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to bundle up. Well, I have to say that I'm doing um, a research trip at the Johnson Library at in Austin, uh, and um, uh -huh. it was. <laughs> And there was an ice storm and everything was shut down. Oh, yeah. So here I am. It was, it was unreal. No, Texans but, um, don't know how to drive really in icy weather. We just don't do it. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was, it was really fun. <laughs> yeah, best to keep us off the roads when there's ice. <laughs> it's just like England. If it snows here, people are, it's like, they don't know what to do. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I look forward to speaking you. to you again in the new year, and uh, I look forward to future transitions. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye-bye.